Warren Pohl, one of the co-founders of 33 Shake, and welcome to another episode of the 33 Shake vlog. On today's video, we have a huge treat for you. It is a feast of endurance knowledge from none other than four-time World Ironman champion, Chrissy Wellington. Uh, as regular viewers will know, Chrissy's been on the team at 33 Shake for a long time. And at a recent event of ours, she was in conversation with top sports writer Tim Hemming, and she just dropped knowledge bombs galore. Everything from racing to motivation to mindset, training, the lot. Now, this content was just too good to keep to just the few hundred people who actually managed to get tickets to the event. That's why we wanted to share it all with you here now. Because as you know, at 33 Shape, our mission is delivering maximum value to endurance athletes. And we do that in these videos by sharing the very best in training, mindset, racing, and nutrition knowledge for your endurance performance. And we also do it in store at 33shape.com with our groundbreaking natural sports nutrition products. Anyway, enough of that. Let's get into it. Without any further ado, it's Chrissy Wellington in conversation with Tim Henning. Hands up, who hasn't heard of Chrissy Wellington? Right, that's a good start. <laughs> yes, that's why we're here. I'll give a, I'll give a, a quick recap to, to Chrissy. I'm sure you're quite well versed. One incredible athlete, four time Ironman world champion, as, as Warren said, unbeaten 13 from 13 at, at the Iron Distance. And, I've just got better and better. Um, she's engaged to probably the, the nicest man for me in triathlon, <laughs> Mr. Tom Lowe, fine triathlete himself, fantastic in uh, in her, probably the second fastest Brit in Hawaii. Um, and she's also the reigning women's champion in man versus horse, <laughs> oh, where, yes. where she probably took down Warren, is that correct? Significantly, yeah. I would have done an interview afterwards, but you were already at home. And I'm still <laughs> yeah. So, look, it, it, it's not a history lesson. We're, we're here to talk about optimizing your performance, and that's why we got Chrissy. And I honestly, personally think you couldn't find anyone better to talk about that. And I'm going to give you, you two examples, and I'm sure they'll be familiar ones to you, but I think it's worth going over these. Now, 2011, Challenge Roth. Arguably the, the best triathlon, if, if you don't know, probably the best triathlon in the world. Certainly the finest supported triathlon in the world. You'd probably agree with that one, wouldn't you? We've got over 2.4 miles swim. We've got 49.49. A bike, 112 miles, 4 hours, 40 minutes. And a 244 marathon off the back of that. Even quick, quicker than me, that one. Um, <laughs> now, that right is, that is, that's the world record. That's, it's not just the world record. The next, I look, had to look this one up, but the next fastest lady ever is Caroline Stephan, who, who's done an 8.34 in Melbourne. So that's 16 minutes faster than any lady has ever gone over an iron distance to try and give some perspective to that. Now, that was Chrissy, uh, absolutely her finest, and yet, and yet, that's still not her best performance. I don't think, and I, you can correct me if I'm wrong on this, because I think her best performance came some months later at the Ironman World Championships in Kona 2011, where she had to drop out ill the previous year, so she wasn't the defending champion, having won it the three years pre prior to that. Everything's going swimmingly, right? Best shape ever. Two weeks out from race day, comes off the bike, and torn pectoral and intercostal muscles, taking antibiotics for a fortnight, tries to swim, ends up spending six hours in the Kona Community Hospital days before the race, Not an experience with a anymore. CT scan to check for a pulmonary embolism, or if she's got broken ribs, which thankfully she hadn't. And I mean, you can go and see the pictures and you can see how beat up and the road rash and everything. So, try and follow the Ironman coverage to watch that race. And now I, I remember, after a swim of 101, Chrissy comes out and there's a great smile on her face. She normally swim much quicker than that, as we've said about Rock. But you were just glad to get through the swim, weren't you? Yeah. So she's got a beaming smile. She biked 4.56. When she came into T2, she was 21 minutes down on the woman's leader. She was sixth, actually, woman onto that run. She then ran a 2.52 to win that race by three minutes, and she was being run down by Marinda Caffrey, who ran pretty much exactly the same split as her. And, that, and when you finished that, you were just, you were done, weren't you? That was like, put a fork in you, you're done. And, and actually, that was your last competitive race, and you retired. And, and to me, that is, 
maybe you could say Paula Radcliffe's 215 on the marathon, but that is optimizing your performance to some level. So I think, you know, a round of applause for that, because that was even... Yeah. Yeah, I, I can't understand how that's just a mind blowing effort that was. It really was. Anyway, nothing blowing smoke on. Right. Um, we're, we're talking about optimizing performance. I know we, there's a danger that time's going to run away with us here. So, we're going to look at some areas where Chrissy's going to give you her experience and where you can obviously take that away and, and, and some of those kind of key points. So, the fir first thing we're going to look at is training, which is, which is obviously the, the biggie. And when you, when you came to the sport, it's fair to say you were probably quite green. And when you decided to go pro, which was a big decision, and you went into an extremely intense, competitive um, surroundings, you must have thought, I've just got to go hard, 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 hard. But can you talk us through those initial stages and maybe when you thought, actually, that's, that's not right, that's not necessarily the answer. Yeah, I was an amateur athlete in yeah. 2006, and I was fortunate to have a, a coach in, in Tim Weeks, who was, a, who was a great guy. What many people don't know, actually, is in the run-up to the World Age Group Championships, I actually wasn't running. I had a, a, a run injury, and so I wasn't running. So the maximum kind of run I was doing was 30 minutes on grass. So it was very swim and bike intensive in the run-up to the, to the World Championships, with with hardly any running. So I amazed myself by managing to, to win the World Age Group Championships. And at that point, I was juggling training. So I'd say around 25 hours a week with a full-time job, with you know social life, living in, living in London, um, with absolutely no intention of ever being a professional athlete. And you did win that thing overall, though. This, you and, just until I won the World Age Group Championships, Tim introduced me to the person that would become my, my then coach and I actually went for a trial run with, with Brett in, in Switzerland in the January of, um, of that year and I was so nervous, I'd been actually been sick over Christmas and I was, I was so incredibly worried about how I'd perform, you know, I, I guess I, I come across as quite a confident person but in, inside I was trembling and I really didn't think I could succeed as a professional athlete and he took one look at me and he said, Chrissy, after about three days you've got what it takes physically but I'm going to have to chop your head off. And it was this kind of macabre way of telling me I had a lot of work to do psychologically. Um, and I took the plunge um, to and, and became a professional athlete and it wasn't without a lot of angst actually. And I think we're all scared of making change and I'm like everyone else and I was so scared of leaving my job and taking the plunge of becoming a professional athlete. I was so scared of failure, so scared of what people would think, scared of not being able to, you know, pay the bills. But you never want to look back and think, what if? And, and so I became a professional athlete and I thought, right, I want to focus on Olympic distance. <coughs> um, and Brett essentially trained me as an Olympic distance athlete, so with Olympic distance volume. So my, my bike rides were, you know, three hours. My runs were not um, longer than, say, 90, 90 minutes. Um, and I was surprised that I didn't find the training, you know, all that difficult. You know, I think I adapted to it quite easily. And then Brett said to me, Chrissy, do you want to do an Ironman? And I thought, well, I haven't been doing Ironman training. And so I said to him, am I ready? And he said, yes. Were you doing the intensity or you were doing the shorter stuff? And that's the key. And I think there's this misconception in our sport that in order to do triathlon, in order to do endurance events, in order to do Ironman, one needs to, to have X number of hours <coughs> logged in the logbook or you need X number of miles. And actually, my strength and my speed and my endurance increased when I reduced the volume of training that I was doing, but increased the intensity. So saying that, we can't all go into doing nothing into you know, high-quality, intense work. We need a what we call a, an endurance base, and I have that endurance base. But once you have that, there is no point in banging out miles and miles and hours and hours of work, it's junk. It's absolute junk. And people think, well, I've logged a six-hour ride. 
Hence, are we fit enough to do that in a race? Psychologically, it's beneficial because you know you can bank a six hour ride. Physically, it can be. It won't advance you or it could undermine what you're trying to achieve. So, I guess what I'm trying to say is that the volume of training that I was doing was probably a lot less than what people may have imagined and in fact at the outset I was training for, for Olympic distance. So maybe explain just a little bit about Brett at that time. He's quite a quirky character and he does have this reputation for sort of flogging his athletes a little bit rightly or wrongly um, but you felt that actually the volume he was giving you you could, you could cope with. When you it was up. challenging physically, I won't deny that, it was, mm. it was definitely challenging physically. Um, what was more challenging was the psychological changes he was trying to, to make. Um, that's what I found much more difficult. Um, the, the physical training, um, I wasn't doing nearly the same volume as athletes like Bella Comford or, or Belinda Granger or Hilary Biscay. They were quite high volume athletes and they could withstand that. My body physically isn't as capable of withstanding that, that, that high volume and I don't necessarily need to do it. So the emphasis for me was very much on, on high quality high quality strength work and, and interval work and less on um, less on kind of logging, you know, high, high volume training. Um, but it was psychologically, I think, where Brett made the difference. So I, when I went to him, it was an anathema to, to rest. For me, resting was absolutely tantamount to weakness. So to have, to have a rest day was like saying I'd failed. If someone said to me, have you run today? And I said, no, I felt like a, a complete failure. Um, and coupled with that, I couldn't rest my mind. So if I, I overanalyzed everything, I overanalyzed if I had a bad race, if I had a bad session, you know, I thought about everything. And he said, you know, he said to me basically that you have to be able to rest your mind and you have to be able to rest your body. And for me, that was so incredibly challenging. And unless I got a handle on my brain, I would never have achieved what, what I did. So on reflection and given all your experience, and I imagine most people out here are, are some working age group athletes, do you feel that the training that you did, you could only have done by, by virtue of the fact that you were a professional athlete and then Brett eventually made sure that you rested between sessions? Because I, I think a lot of a lot of people will, will read the magazines, look online, and go, "Well, you have to run 90k a week. You have to be biking all of these miles." And yet they're trying to fit in a work and family life around that. You do the best in the context of your life, and that's what people forget. You're the best athlete that you can possibly be in the context of your life. I was a professional athlete, and I saw training in a totally holistic sense. So for me. I was training my body to be the best it could be. So for me, training was, yes, it was swim, bike and run. It was strength and conditioning. It was massage, it was physio, it was nutrition and hydration. It was putting my feet up, it was getting enough sleep. That was training. So you can log as many hours or miles as you like swim, bike and running, but unless you take care of the minutiae, you will never ever achieve your, achieve your potential. As a professional, I had that luxury. I could train four or six hours a day. I had 18 hours a day to rest. 18 hours to rest, you know? So I could, I could take care of myself in the entirety. Amateur athletes just don't have that luxury. So you have to fit triathlon into the context of your life rather than trying to fit your life into the context of triathlon. Um, so you have to look at your lifestyle. You have to look at when you're, you know, when you're working, what you you know, what, what hours you're working, what your family commitments are, and slot in your must-have sessions into the available into the available slots. But also, you also sorry, you also need to see rest as part of training and not an, an add-on or a, or a luxury. Mm. It's absolutely fundamental because training breaks your body. That's what it does. That's why you train. You train to stress your body. 
But unless you rest, your body can never rebuild. It can never recover. So you continually stress it, continually stress it. It can take it for a little while, and then eventually, bang, oh dear, I've got a stress fracture. I wonder why. You, you know, and I've been there, and I've, and I've done it, and I've suffered from that as well. So I, I, I speak from experience, kind of not martyrdom. And it, it amazes me how many athletes do not rest sufficiently because they're scared to. Now, you were about seven years professional. Over that time, you'd have been, yeah, you go. Over that time, you've been building your endurance base, layering it on year on year. How did your, can you give us some specifics in the way your training changed over those years? Um, and maybe also relate to some of perhaps the strength and conditioning stuff where eventually when you retired, Dave Scott was sort of coach and advisor. Dave's a huge on the strength and conditioning side of it, so could maybe bring that in as a, as a, as a factor. My, my training evolved over the, I was at five years as a professional athlete, it, it evolved. And it's very easy when you're successful to do what you've always done especially someone like me, you know, you find a formula that works, you want to stick to it. Um, but as an athlete, you're constantly evolving and your training has to evolve to, to meet that, to, to adapt to that. Um, oh, my training changed subtly in my move from Brett to, to Dave. Brett took me as far as I think I, I could go. Um, Dave nuanced me as, a, as an athlete. Um, he was very, very clever in the way that he did things because I'm a creature of habit and I resisted change and I wanted to do the sessions that Brett had set me. And so I pushed back and pushed back and Dave slowly um, integrated new sessions into my, um, into my program, new ways of, new ways of doing things. Um, he, he further reduced the volume and he upped the intensity um, by which I mean for example my, my brick session rather than just running off the bike and, and running and just at tempo pace I'd go off the bike I'd do between 14 and 16k off, off a 3 hour ride but that would be at what we call swing pace. So I'd do 500 meters or a K at faster than race pace. Then I'd do a K at race pace. Then I'd do 500 meters or a K at faster than race pace. And so you're practicing race pace, but also testing your body off the back of a, a hard ride. And that's something I'd, I'd never done with Brett. The other thing that Dave introduced was the treadmill. Mm, so also, sorry, just to interject. So 16 kilometers at race pace and then faster than race pace off a hard bike. Yes. That's a tough session. It's, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, a tough, it's a tough session. <laughs> that was Wednesday. Thursday was a double bike day and a, and a swim. Thursday was always hard. Um, you could see that he reduced it. <laughs> he, he, did really, he did reduce the volume. Um, but what Dave introduced the treadmill. Um, which revolutionised my running because it um, it forced me to increase my leg turnover. My leg turnover was already quite fast, but to be a good uh, runner off the bike, you want to have quite a rapid footfall. Um, and so the treadmill encouraged that. So we both did speed work on kind of 0.5% gradient and then um, hills on the treadmill. Um, but Dave also introduced strength and conditioning. It was something that Brett disagreed with fundamentally. Um, however, I believe for, the long, for longevity, you, everyone should incorporate strength and conditioning into their program, but it needs to be targeted. There's no point in coming into a gym and just lifting a, a few weights and hoping that you're going to develop some kind of you know, inner physical strength. You need to be assessed, you need to ascertain what your strengths and weaknesses were. So my weaknesses were particularly on my right side, my knee fell in. My knee fell in not because, you know, my knee fell in, but my knee fell in because my glutes and my hamstrings were so weak. Um, my, I couldn't negative, oh, I could, I'd always, sorry, I'd always um, get slower at the back end of a marathon. Well, you think, oh, that's, you know, that's natural. Well, it, well it's not. I didn't, you didn't feel glycogen energy depleted, I didn't feel like I had a glycogen deficiency, 
my form had gone. My form had gone because my hamstrings and my glutes were incapable of carrying me. Dave recognised that and he saw that I looked like I was sitting down in the last 10k of the marathon. So we need to work on that. So I had some really targeted strength and conditioning work to um, give me the strength, especially at the back end of the marathon. And it worked. And I was able to negative split that to 44, not only because of the running training that I'd done, or the swimming, or the biking, but also because of the strength and conditioning. And that's, sorry, that's one other thing to remember. I know I'm rambling, but hopefully it's useful. <laughs> is that people compartmentalize our sport, right? So people come to me and they say, Chrissy, I want to be a faster runner. Can you tell me what I need to do in my run training? And I say to them, well, what's your position on the bike? What do you eat on the bike? What equipment are you using on the bike? Um, what's your bike set up like? What bike training are you doing? And they say, no, Chris, you don't understand. I want to be a faster runner. And I say, I do understand. And that's why I'm talking about your bike. I was a faster runner, not necessarily only because of what I was doing in terms of run training, but because of what I did on the bike. Why didn't I wear an aero helmet? It would have made me go faster on the bike. Of course it would have done. But I get really claustrophobic. It makes me anxious and I get dehydrated because I dissipate a lot of heat from my head. So when does that dehydration hit you? Not on the bike, when you've gone five minutes faster. It hits you at 30k on the marathon when you're walking and you're saying, why am I so dehydrated? Oh, I'll start chugging water, I'll start chugging water. It's too late. You're walking on the marathon because of the decisions that you made on the bike. And we're triathletes, we're not swimmers, we're not bikers, and we're not runners. And I think that's really that's a really, really important thing to remember. In the context of training, what you do on the run will help or hinder the other the other disciplines. So you need to see it in the entirety. Right. Um conscious that we want to save a bit of time for QA at the end. So we're gonna move on to race day. Yes. Now, when you got into the sport, you were relatively unknown. You were quite unknowing. That first time you went to Hawaii, you didn't really know any of the other girls. I think Brett said you don't worry yeah. about what anyone's doing. Pretty much from that day on, though, you had a big target on your back. You were the hunted. So that kind of must affect your mentality, I suppose, going in. But what are the key things that you put in place for race day? And, and for everybody out there, what would be the key things to think about? Um... My race strategy evolved, and I think everyone should remember that. I think people go into races expecting perfection. It's, that's, that's not going to happen. It's an unrealistic expectation to go into a race and think that everything is going to go according to plan. It doesn't for me, and it won't for you. Things will go wrong. Your goggles will get knocked off. You'll get a cramp. You, you'll get a flat tyre. You'll get a stitch on the run. Something will happen. That's racing, and that's what makes your race perfect because hopefully you'll up overcome those imperfections perfectly. That's why my race was the best, my last race was the best race I'd ever run. Not because everything went perfectly, it was absolutely horrific, but I overcame it all perfectly. And that's what I'm so, that's what I'm so proud of. So the first thing I re realized was that racing in itself is, is, is a, a, a learning experience. You're always, always learning and always evolving. My strategy evolved. Um, going into the race, I utilized a lot of the techniques that I practiced in training um, psychologically. Um, and I, I think, the, the psychological side of sport is one that's overlooked and people have their logbooks and swim, bike, run, tick, tick, tick. They don't have a logbook for, for mental training. And then they panic or they worry when things don't go according to plan. Well, that's because they haven't developed the tools. But they are tools and you can develop them. You can develop mental strength. So I got through the last race in Kona, not only because of, you know, the latent physical strength that I had, but also because of the psychological tools that I'd developed. So whether that's um, this ability to disassociate my mind from my body and take my mind into um, 
a very, very happy place, which I've had to do in training, whether it's breaking the session down. You know, we've all had hard sessions and we thought we haven't been able to do that, so you break it down. You know, we used to do 40 times 100 in the swimming pool at race pace. Bang, 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 bang. Start that final race thinking, oh my God, I'm, I'm racing for nine hours. I just think I've got to get to that swim boy. And then why do you think I'm smiling when I get out the swim? Because it's awesome. I've gone out the swim. And then the bike ride is 40K. I can always manage 40K. And then the marathon is ten lo uh, four lots of 10K and a bit of change. So you break it down. When the going gets really tough, you break it down to the person in front or the aid stations or whatever. But you, you just you don't necessarily see it in, in the entirety. And that was really important to me. Um, having songs in, in my head, that's very important. I tend to count repetitively um, over and over again. Um, before a race, actually, I, I used to have a Kona playlist, which is really embarrassing, so no one's ever going to get hold of it. Um, <laughs> it's got Lion King soundtrack. Kind we'll of embarrassing, get, embarrassing, we'll embarrassing songs. Um, but I used to run, I, I mean, I used to train on a Lee Drive and on the Queen K or whatever race at the Roth I was doing, and I used to listen to my iPod with a, a playlist. And then I'd identify landmarks with songs so that when I raced, that's what I heard when I was racing. I heard those songs and they, they meant something to me and they, and, they, and they mattered to me. So I think that those are you know, psychological tools that we can all, that we can all use um, in training that then apply, you apply them in racing, but it's too late on race day to realize you haven't got them. <laughs> they've, got to be, they've got to be developed in, in, um, in training. But you, know, you mentioned the pressure. We all feel pressure. I felt pressure, you know, in, in every race that I did. We all put pressure on ourselves. That's a beautiful thing about sport. We're challenging <coughs> ourselves. It's not a challenge. You don't feel any pressure, and it's not worth doing it. So, do you uh, still feel pressure now? Uh, when you when you go out? And yes, play? of course, of course, I do. But you manage it. You, everyone, you know, everyone gets nervous. Everyone suffers from lapses in motivation, and everyone feels the pressure, but there are techniques to cope with it. You know, leaning on, leaning on other people is really important to me. Watching videos of people that have overcome adversity. You know, before Kona 2011, I read Steve Redgrave's book, and I realized what he'd been through to get to his five gold medals, and I thought, wow, if you can do it, then, then I can do it too. So that really helps, you know, give me, give me a boost. Perspective is so, you know, it's so important. You know triathlon is important, but the world is not going to end. And the millions and millions and millions of people in this world don't care if I win the world championship or not. At the, at, at the, no, but at the end of the day, it's a sport and it's supposed to be fun. And the world is not going to fall apart if I do or if I, I don't win. Yes, it matters. Of course it matters. I want to do justice to myself and all the training. But I think we all need to keep it in perspective and having that perspective helped me cope you know cope with the pressure just on um just on ironman races second um anyone who's done one of well, i guess you, you you would know anyway but it's an incredibly early start of the morning it's sort of pitch black and you get out there and it's all eerie when did when does race day start for you is it a flicker switch right race mode race day starts or is it um, the night before the morning oh what so if, if you've got kona yeah yeah. Um, January. Right. Okay. Yeah. No, I say that in all seriousness. Every minute of every single day from the end of my off season was dedicated to Kona. Everything I did was geared towards that that goal. And did that become a more important goal the more times you won it? And then after 2010, when you had to put out late, did that become even more critical? Yeah, I mean, there were. Though I had three. Three A goals, if you call them that, in, in the season. I always wanted to do three Ironman races, so I had three kind of peaks. But you know, Kona's a big daddy, and that's what you train for. But you know, race day, training for race day starts right then, and, and everything from then is geared towards make you know getting me in the best shape possible. Um, in terms of uh, tapering for race day. I, I tapered less than people would think. You know, 
compared to the majority of age group triathletes, I was, I was doing around 30 hours a week. So if you dramatically reduce the volume, you will go into the race with fatigue. So you should reduce the volume proportion to what you do ordinarily. You reduce the, vol the junk almost completely and you keep the intensity. So for example, the, the, the brick session, if the race is on a, a, a Saturday, I might do a, the brick session on a, on a Tuesday or Wednesday. Um, that would be a two hour ride into a 25 minute run, but I'd do five volts of three minutes hard in that run. You know, I, and the day, and then the penultimate day, um, so say the race, the race is on a Saturday, but Thursday is a complete rest day. Complete rest day, you have obligations and professional that day, usually the press conference, pro brief and things, but that's a total rest day. The day before the race, I do a 2K swim with about 300 meters of effort, um, 25 meters, breaking down 25 and 50s. Uh, hour and a quarter bike, again, with some three, four minute efforts in, and then a 25 minute run with some what we call strides. So 30, 30 second, one minute, one minute efforts. So that's the day before, that's the day before the race. Um, I always do the, the bike earlier in the day because if you have a mechanical, you've got the rest of the day to deal with it. If you leave the bike right until just before you're racking it and you end up with a flat tire or something like that, then you know, panic sets in. So um, I always did the bike early. I used to have dinner around 6-ish, 6.30-ish. Used to go to bed around 9.30. You never sleep well before a race, ever. So don't expect to, and don't stress if you don't. You know, the key is to bank as much sleep in the kind of weeks before the race rather than expect a good eight hours the night of the race. Um, if the race starts at 6.30, I'd be up at around 3.45, 4. I'd have breakfast two and a quarter hours before the race. Um, you happy bunny then, chatting away? Or no, I... I <laughs> think that answered that. I, I'm not a particularly pleasant person to be around in, a, in a, maybe two days before a race. Not because I'm snappy, but I just tend to withdraw into myself. So I don't tend to be that communicative. Um, so I wouldn't say I was a nasty person to be around, but I'd just say I was pretty dull. Um, and yeah, I tend to, to withdraw, I tend to do a lot of visualization, a lot of relaxation techniques, a bit of self-massage, um, you know, videos, reading, things like that. So I just tend to, to keep myself to myself as, as much as possible. Um, in, in the kind of days and, and even hours before the race. Even, you know, before the race starts, I take myself off and just sit, uh, sit there, listen to, listen to some music, just try and be away from, you know, the noise and, 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 and the hassle. I know um, a lot of amateur athletes like to get their wetsuits on about three hours before the start, um, which isn't very good if you need the toilet. But, no, you not, know, not in a white, not in a wetsuit too. It's true, but yeah. we, um, you know, it's important to be prepared, but, you know, take yourself off, have that, have that little bit of time. Don't be in, um, you know, the heat of the, of, of the race, you know, too early on. Okay, let's. Um, so we're here for the, the launch of the three shape um, gal. So let's move on and talk a little bit about nutrition. Yep. What's your, what is what do you understand by by good nutrition? What be your definition? Bless you. Bless you. It's it's evolved. It's a you know literally a moving feast. Um, and my concept of nutrition has changed from when I was a, a non-athlete. Um, and started running to, to lose weight, um, developed an eating disorder, had um, a very distorted view of, of, of nutrition and, and, and fueling and body image, uh, only to find running and that to be my saviour because it enabled me to get a better handle on fueling for, for performance. So I read a lot about um, what I believe I needed to do in order to be able to, to fuel for performance. Um, and that's evolved into my sports nutrition strategy that exists today. My 
sports nutrition strategy is my daily diet. And that's what people forget. People talk about sports nutrition and they think energy drink, gels, and a few cardboard type bars, right? That's not. Your sports nutrition for your race day performance is what you eat every day. So my daily diet is wholesome, natural, um, close to the source as possible foods. So I, I'm fortunate that I don't have any intolerances. I eat what I call kind of complex carbs. So a lot of, a lot of quinoa and spell, wild rice, not a lot of white stuff, which is essentially um, carbohydrates with all the good stuff taken out. So not a lot of white rice, not a lot of white pasta, um, not a lot of white bread. So a lot of unrefined carbs. Um, I eat a lot of lean meat, so a lot of fish, poultry, and chicken. Um, loads of nuts, loads of seeds, fresh fruit and vegetables, um, you know, eggs. I, I eat a healthy, well-balanced diet. It's not rocket science. And as an athlete, I supplemented that with what is better known as sports nutrition products. So, and I say that really carefully, so it was a supplement, and I think there's a misconception, um, and I, one that you know, we concur with, is that people are overusing these products. People think that professional athletes are sucking on energy drinks and gels every day in training. We're not. We use them but we use them really, really sparingly. I could count on the, my two hands the number of times I had an energy gel when I was doing my long run, which was up to 32 kilometers. I didn't do it on anything. I did my long run on a couple of rice cakes with peanut butter and honey and a cup of coffee. And that's what I did my long run on. Um, and people wonder why I'm fuel efficient. Well, it's a, you know, it's about training your body to, to you know, to, to be so. In in a race, I I used energy drinks and I used I used gels, but I used them so sparingly, and I knew what worked for me. I knew what was palatable for me, but it wasn't the kind of foundation for my nutritional strategy, um, and. So I believe that race day nutrition starts long before race day. You know, people, it's almost like a, I don't know, a, a crux to, do, to just lean on these sure. yeah. products and hope that they're going to, to, give you the sustenance that you need, but they're addictive. And the more you take them, the more you need. So, for example, if, if I was to, to go out and bike ride and every 30 minutes I took a gel, that's what your body is always gonna need when you go for that bike ride. Because you're not training your body to know any different. Our bodies are trainable. And I trained my body to be very fuel efficient. Um, and I, I believe that one should stick mainly to whole foods and use sports nutrition sparingly. Okay. So, what drove you to team up with the Daily Food Shake and to being here tonight? Because our philosophy philosophies matched. Um, I was sick and tired of um, reading a list of ingredients I didn't understand. And that goes for sports nutrition and it goes for my daily life. You know, you make a Bakewell tart at home. You make a Bakewell tart out of butter, ground almonds, maybe a bit of raspberry jam, some sugar and eggs. You buy a whatever brand baked or tart, it hasn't got any eggs in it, or it's got reconstituted egg white. It hasn't got any it hasn't got any butter, it's never seen an it's never seen an almond, it's never seen a piece of fruit. 
but it's called a vapor tart, and it's not it's a chemical experiment. And I get and I and I got sick of it. And I just started to read a lot more around the the research that had been undertaken in order to justify the sports nutrition products that people were using, and I found it to be somewhat hollow. Um, and I also got increasingly concerned about the number of people that spoke to me about just the things that you asked for show of hands on. How many people have, have you know, gone to the toilet in the bushes? Well, I have. How many people have, you know, suffered from cramps? Well, you know, I have. How many people have vomited? Yeah, of course. And, well, that's not natural, it's not normal, and it's not part and parcel of sport, and it shouldn't be. Um, so we just started talking about whether there was a, a different solution, and I started using the products, I love the products, and so we decided, I, I wanted to team up with a company that I believed in. Thank you. Um, right, I'm just going to ask you one final one, and then we'll throw it open for some questions and answers. Um, just on coaching, um, it's a triathlon, a fairly expensive sport. So do people need to need to invest and have a coach? Do you think that's an important part of it? Um, much depends on what stage you're at, um, and what your goals are, and what your background is, and what your experience is in the sport. What I would say is that. Training needs to be tailored to you and your life. Um, and a coach can be very, very valuable in enabling you to do that. A coach can be very valuable in taking the weight off your shoulders. For me, a coach was very, very important because it meant I ceased worrying. It was a revelation for me to me when Brett said, you haven't got to worry anymore, you just follow the order. And as a fiercely independent person, that was so scary, but it was also so liberating. I'm like, I don't have to think about whether or not I'm doing the right session. I just place my trust in that person, and I follow that order, and I trust in, in his judgment that he'll get me from, you know, from, from A to B. Um, and I think that that's, you know, that's really important. Other people need a coach to motivate themselves, I never needed that. I was a um, you know, highly motivated individual, so I could follow a training plan even if I set myself that, that training plan. But for some people, being accountable to a coach you know, is, you know, is, very, very, is very important. Um, what is important is that the athlete empowers themselves. That even if you have a coach, empower yourself. Understand why you're doing what you're doing. Um, and that was very, very important, and I think that's why my relationship with Dave was so successful, because not only did I follow his order, but he explained to me why I was following whatever order I, I'd, you know, I'd been given. And I think that's very, very important, that we all empower ourselves to understand what we're doing and, and, and why we're doing it. So that's not to say don't get a coach, but have a coach that can explain those things to you, um, and obviously not all coaches are made equal, so you're better off having no coach than having a shit coach, um, and there are a lot of the latter out there, unfortunately, it's all too easy to pay 300 quid and get your British triathlon license, it's less easy to have the experience in being able to read and understand an athlete, and that's absolutely key, and that's why my coaches were so successful, is because they understood me. They could read me like a book. I used to walk on the pool deck, on the pool side, and Brett used to say, you're hanging, you're not getting in the water. And I hadn't done a thing, I'd just walked on, walked on the pool deck. But he knew me, he could read me like an absolute book. And Dave, and Dave is the same, and that's a talent, and that's a talent that they don't teach you at the British Triathlon Level 1 coaching course. Um, that's not to say all coaches are bad, but I think, you know, make sure you've got a good one if, if you have one mm. at all. Have you got to get on with your coach? You've got to have a good relationship with your coach. Um, I, my relationship with Brett was very challenging for me, especially at, at, 
at the start. Um, um, but I came to I came to respect him, um, and and we got on well as as coach and athlete, but also as friends towards towards the end. Um, and Dave and I likewise were. We, get on, we, we were great professionally, but we also got on personally. And I think that that's really important that you have that, you have that connection. Um, because your goal is ultimately in their, in their hands. Um, and I think it's important that you have you know, a strong relationship, a strong open relationship, an honest relationship with whoever you, have, you, know, you choose as your coach. But, and also not to be scared to change coaches. As well, you know, it's often nerve-wracking as an athlete, whether you're a professional or amateur, to, to change a coach and to say that's not working for me. But like I said, it's you know, it's a constant state of evolution, um, training and, and racing, and and what you need for uh, you know, from a coach in the first few years might not be what you need, you know, in the latter in the latter stages. And the best coaches in the world would be the ones that said, "I've done all I can with you," and. Off you go. Thank you, Chrissy. Wow. Chrissy Wellington, ladies and gentlemen. She is a total rock star. Hope you enjoyed that one. Uh, to connect with all things 33 Shake, you'll find us on social media and on email. Drop us a line, get in touch, hook up any way you like. All of the contact details and everything you need are in the show notes below. And remember, if you're looking for the very best in sports nutrition for your next running event, cycling event, triathlon, long distance swim, anything like that, you know where to come. Come check us out at 33shake.com.